Omaha's news leader, chronicling the stories and people making a difference in our community. This is KETV News Watch 7's Chronicle. Civility in politics. Haven't seen much of it over the last few years, but we have seen flashes of it during two high-profile political funerals this year. First, with Senator John McCain's passing. He made us better presidents, just as he made the Senate better, just as he made this country better. Becoming John McCain's friend is one of the great blessings of my life. John's story is the American story. That's not hyperbole. It sounds like it's the American story, grounded in respect and decency. Earlier this month, we lost the 41st president of the United States, George H.W. Bush, and there were more reminders of what politics used to be like. I was not uh, engaged in any name calling or I'm trying to stay with this 11th commandment. It's pretty tough, but I'm going to stay with it. Thou shalt not speak ill of another Republican. I always thought he was fair minded, uh, even though there were times when I wished he'd had another position. We need somebody like President George H.W. Bush. He valued uh, the importance of public service uh, above the winning and losing of politics. And sometimes that was to his detriment, but it was better for the country. Hey, good morning. I'm Rob McCartney. This is KETV News Watch 7's Chronicle. This morning, we're talking politics, something we've done a lot this year. In fact, if you're a regular viewer of this show, you won't be surprised to know we devoted a total of 18 weeks in 2018, over a third of our shows, talking with politicians leading up to the primary and to the midterm elections. So why return to the topic? Because one thing I hear again and again, civility in politics seems to be lacking these days. Just listen to the call to action from those who eulogized George H.W. Bush. Here's KETV News Watch 7's David Earle. The first eulogy at the National Cathedral came from the president's biographer. An imperfect man, he left us a more perfect Union. Now, John course, Meacham joined Bush's legacy with one of the nation's the greatest the leaders. Lincoln and Bush both called on us to choose the right over the convenient, to hope rather than to fear. The current president and three others who held the post heard it all. World leaders paid their respects too. I believe it will be said that no occupant of the Oval Office was more courageous, more principled, and more honorable than George Herbert Walker Bush. Through all the speeches, the theme of Bush's life. Loyalty to his country, loyalty to his family, loyalty to his friends. Alan Simpson was one of those friends and spoke to the character of the man who called on Americans to make a kinder, gentler nation. He never hated anyone. He knew what his mother and my mother always knew, hatred, corrodes the container it's carried in. The service honoring the last president of the greatest generation ended with this challenge from the Bush family pastor. Some have said in the last few days, this is an end of an era, but it does not have to be. Perhaps it's an invitation to fill the hole that has been left behind. As David Earle reporting, two of Nebraska's top former politicians and one current one are taking up that charge. In fact, they're all talking about civility and what it looks like from the president on down. On the, the points of civility and rhetoric, obviously, I think most Nebraskans, even those who are deeply Trump sympathetic voters, um, don't think that the president is a great role model for their kids. I think that's pretty obvious to people. Um, but I do think one of the things that's wrong in our moment is we're looking to politics to solve our deep problems. And the role models for our kids mostly should be people that you actually know that care about the neighborhood where you're raising your kids. Uh, obviously, there are a bunch of things I wish the president would do differently, but I think we shouldn't be looking for salvation from politics, we're never going to find it there. We'll hear more from Nebraska Senator Ben Sass coming up. First, we're connecting with two former U.S. Senators from Nebraska. Chuck Hagel, Bob Kerry are from different sides of the political aisle, but both believe there needs to be more public civility or the country's in danger. And KETV News Watch 7's Andrew Ozaki shares their message. Chuck Hagel. If there's no civility, 
There's no mutual respect. And there's an absolutism that seeps into politics that is very dangerous. And Bob Carey. It's easier to hate today than it used to be. Uh, because it's easier to have people pay attention to you. And again, I don't have an answer to it other than ignore it. Two former U.S. senators coming together at a forum at the University of Nebraska Innovation Campus to discuss civility in politics and how it affects Nebraska's future. Obviously, the most contentious issue right now in America is the question of immigration. Um, and uh, if you're going to get federal legislation uh, to solve that problem, it's going to have to have Republican and Democrats on board. That means you're going to have real angry uh, Republicans and real angry Democrats who don't like the compromise. Hegel says the willingness to compromise or even listen to the other side is lost in today's society. So on the left, you tune in to MSNBC on the right, Fox News, and you just keep reinforcing your point of view. The rest of those people are idiots. Hegel says when he was first elected, Kerry reached out to him saying what issues they could agree on and work together. I've never heard uh, another two senators doing that of different parties representing the same state. That fostered a respect the two senators share today. We would chuck this reason to hope, but we got to fight against this hate because uh, if you don't fight against hate, it wins. In Lincoln, Andrew Ozaki, KETV, News Watch 7. Kerry is currently managing director of an investment banking firm in New York. Hagel was the Secret Secretary of Defense during the Obama administration. Well, current Nebraska Senator Ben Sass also feels passionately about the topic. In fact, he just wrote a new book called Them, Why We Hate Each Other and How to Heal. We talked, talked with Senator Sass earlier about why he wrote it. The most important places in life are your neighborhood, uh, in your local community where you're raising your kids and where you're preparing for the future, where you're building the better mousetrap, where you're building the better app, where you're trying to persuade people to join your church or, uh, or join your Rotary Club Venture Philanthropy Project. Everything that really matters in American life is in your community. And right now, too many of our politicians talk like the center of the world is Washington, D.C. That doesn't work in Washington, and it doesn't work in your local community. And so I think one of the problems of our time is we're starting to act like a major political, a major community that you should identify with is whether or not you're in the Republican or Democratic tribe. I'm, I'm one of the most conservative voters in the U.S. Senate. I'm second or third most conservative voter. So I believe in Republican policy solutions, but I don't believe Republicans and Democrats are going to comfort you in your old age when you're lonely. I believe your churches and your friends are in your neighborhood and your family and your coworkers at the office. So the most important takeaway from my book, Them, is that we need more rootedness in American life. And right now, both our politics and our technology are screaming at you, you can be rootless. You don't have to be from a neighborhood or a place. You can traipse across your social media channel or your cable news channel of choice, and you can find meaning in those screaming tribes. You can't. You find meaning in your neighborhood. Put down your smartphone, invite your neighbors over for dinner, coach Little League. Almost everything that really matters in life is well prior to politics. I think Washington is as divided as it seems, and social media and cable news are as divided as they seem, and they're nasty places most of the time, but most neighborhoods in Nebraska are not that divided. People look at their neighbor, and even if they differ on voting preferences, they ultimately know that the important things in life, I'm sorry, I didn't know my kid wandered through the back of your frame. Uh, hey, buddy, sit down, man. Uh, we got a football we'll throw after this. Um, but the things that really matter are the neighborhood where you're raising your kids, and I think most Nebraska and most Americans fundamentally get that, and we need more of that. We need more of Washington as a servant community for America instead of thinking it's the center of life. Washington is not an interesting enough place to be the center of life. The center of life is the neighborhoods where your viewers are raising their kids. Well, we also asked Senator Sass about President Trump's use of Twitter and how he sees the current state of politics in the country. So I think we have a huge uh, problem of short attention spans in America, and it's true in our politics. So Donald Trump didn't create this problem. He obviously enjoys Twitter in ways that no previous uh, president has ever thought about communicating instantly every thought you might have. But this isn't a President Trump issue narrowly defined. It's a much bigger challenge, which is we're not supposed to think in America that politics should be the main source of people's entertainment. Uh, you don't legislate well. You don't deliberate well if you're trying to do it on a 24-hour news cycle. 
we should be thinking not just 24 months in the future, but 10 and 24 years in the future. And so social media is really detrimental to the way we're doing politics in America right now. We have this problem of politattainment, where people tend to think of their politics as a form of entertainment. Politics should actually be a lot more boring. It should do a small number of really big things that the country needs to prepare the next generation for navigating a free republic. And right now, Washington is dysfunctional, and that flows from both Article 1 and Article 2, both the legislature and the executive branch. And finally, we asked Senator Sass about the violence we've seen this year targeting certain groups and how we can heal that divide. I think the, the simplest way to think about this is whenever there's something terrible that happens in life and the world is a broken place and sinners do all sorts of horrible things and we're universally sinners but not everybody like what the guy in Pittsburgh, the hateful acts he was motivated to commit. But when people try to try, tie that back directly and immediately to politics, more often than not they're wrong in that short term calculus. But there is a bigger problem which is that our politics are not helping solve any of these problems. We're not talking about the things that make the 320 million Americans a we. What do we share in common? What is America about? Most of the important things in life are not done by politics. Whether or not you have a family, whether or not you have a few good friends, whether or not you have meaningful work and an important vocation with coworkers, whether or not you have a worldview framework to make sense of death and suffering, whether or not you have a local church or synagogue and worshiping community, all those really important things are upstream from politics and more important than politics. But what politics should do is define a framework for ordered liberty where 320 million Americans say we believe in the beating heart of an America that's organized around a First Amendment of freedom of religion, freedom of speech, freedom of the press, freedom of assembly, uh, rights of protest. That's what America is about at the political level so that if Washington maintains the framework for ordered liberty, the actual communities where people live in Omaha and Lincoln and Fremont, and I'm flying to Norfolk to campaign uh, from here today, um, those communities are where life is actually lived. And in a community like Squirrel Hill in Pittsburgh, that's where people are loving their neighbor. That's where they're raising their kids. That's where you're getting married and where you're burying people and where you're caring for the, the widow two doors down. That really important stuff is being swallowed by a sense that screaming in politics are where people is, are going to find meaning. It's not true. And so I don't think it's right to take specific tragedies and try to tie them right back to politics and say, who should we point a finger at and who should we blame? But it's definitely the case that our politics are not making anything better. It's making it more um, exacerbated, screaming, short-termist tone. And politics should say, hey, let's calm down and think about the big, how do we get an infrastructure bill that makes sense for 10 years from now? How do we repair roads and bridges so that Nebraska farmers and ranchers can keep feeding the world and get Washington and get political cable news screaming out of the way of talking about big meaning? All right, it's time to take a short break, but when we come back, we'll talk with a local political science expert about how we got to this point and if we can ever return to a kinder, gentler political arena. You're watching KETV News Watch 7's Chronicle. You're watching KETV News Watch 7's Chronicle, and this morning we're taking an in-depth look at how we can have healthier, more positive political discourse in the country. Is that even possible anymore? Well, joining me now to talk more about political civility is Dr. Greg Petro. He's an associate professor of political science, University of Nebraska, Omaha. Good morning. Thanks very much for joining us. Good morning. I'm happy to be here. Thank you. Let me ask you, do you think it's possible to get back to that time? What's important to realize about civility in politics is that in terms of the mass public and voters in general, people pretty much generally agree with one another. There aren't really a lot of large differences in public opinion. And so, for example, there's this book by uh, Morris Fiorina, who's a political scientist who actually looks at issue differences between blue and red states, for example, and finds that they're pretty small. So the kinds of public policies that people in red states want are pretty similar actually to the kinds of public policies that people in blue states want. If you look at the electorate as a group, what you find is there's just a lot of conflict in, in, uh, in terms of uh, people's you know, party ID, a lot of Republicans tend to have a lot of liberal preferences, a good number of Democrats tend to have conservative preferences. And so actually as a group, you know, voters are conflicted and they have, yeah, they have all of these different kinds of policy preferences. Um, sort of what gets us into trouble are these sort of symbolic identities where people think of themselves in terms of being groups. Hmm. So people identify with the Republican Party or the Democratic Party and they think of themselves as being conservative or liberal. And these labels, are highly, highly powerful and very salient to people. And so like Senator Sass said, 
you know, people really sort themselves into these groups based on these labels, even though people pretty much agree with one another. Right. So, so if there's so much agreement going on there, but there's still a feeling about all this incivility going on. Social media to blame? Where, where, where do you point the figure there? Is it, is it the 24 news cycle, cable news, talk shows? What is it? Well, the incivility is real. I mean, in the sense that we see it on our media. And, um, you know, people have, in terms of the evolution of the brain, you know, people have a, people um, sort of in, innately can't really separate very well electronic media from things that they experience in their real life. And so when we see incivility on television, we have the experience you know, physiologically and biologically as if we were experiencing that right in our own personal space. Um, and so people, you know, react very strongly to that. Gotcha. Now, this is not necessarily a new new pro problem, actually. Politics has always been nasty. I mean, there was Adams Jefferson, there was Hamilton Burr, there was uh, Senator Sumner and Congressman Brooks. Uh, Brooks nearly beat Sumner to death on the floor. Um, nothing new, right? No, no, it's not. Um, I like to tell my American government students that when John Adams was running against Thomas Jefferson, he called Thomas Jefferson a vivisectionist. And before all of your viewers have to run to the dictionary to find out what that is, <laughs> right. that is someone who does experiments on awake animals for the pleasure it causes them. So that's a pretty serious charge to wow. call, call someone a vivisectionist. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, so this incivility is, is not new at all. What's right. new is that we have this television medium, right. and it can deliver it to people in this way that is very personal and very visceral. So yeah, I, I don't think we've got to that point yet where vivisectionist has, <laughs> has popped up in any game. Any no, not yet, not yet. So, so let's talk about solution. What, how do we stop the rhetoric? How do we stop that train that we're on now? That's a difficult question. Um, you know, I guess my, my, my thought would be some kind of a social movement. And I know when you hear about social movements, you think people in the streets marching right. and these kinds of things. Um, and instead of, though, people going to the streets and marching, uh, you would have a social movement where people would change the channel, you know. And so we live in a media age that is market driven, um, you know, that the 24 hour news cycle is popular. And these shows that feature all of these disagreements are popular because millions and millions of people watch them. If people are really fed up with it and really want it to stop, they can turn it off or turn the channel. And to do that, you know, you can't have sort of individuals making these isolated decisions. Mm -hmm. You need some kind of, because people just don't work that way, right? You need to have some kind of coordinated communication, uh, something that's orchestrated across groups uh, to lead to that kind of outcome. Yeah, but the problem is you have a person who can just sit somewhere and have a loud voice and, a, and a, have a large stage referencing back to the president and his in his tweets I mean for example if the president is tweeting out certain things does that give other politicians the right if you will or do they feel feel that they're empowered to go ahead and do the same thing because the guy at the top's doing it I do agree that there's a race to the bottom line okay. um, and that the president does uh, does sort of set a moral tone and a national tone and some people like Senator Sass are gonna react to that and, and there's, there'll be a backlash against it and others will sort of respond to it and follow in that manner. Um, and so, you know, again, all we can do is call it out when we see it, talk about how we don't like it. And in terms of media, which is market driven, you know, if people stop watching these shows, they're gonna go away. Mm -hmm. You know, so collectively people have a lot of power and a lot of ability to change things. They just have to start exercising and making these decisions. And if they do, if the mass public responds in that way, I absolutely guarantee you that the elites will as well. I can't tell you how many politicians have said to me, we've lost the ability to agree to disagree, to have a rational discourse along those ways. Basically, it's now my way or the highway. Do you agree with that? I'm always a little hesitant to have that kind of black and white you know, talk or thinking. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I, I do think that we are more that way than we used to be. Also, disagreement doesn't have to be, doesn't have to lead to incivility. I mean, I really want to emphasize that those are two different things. Right. So we do have more, you know, for example, in the Congress now, we have more polarization. We have ways as political scientists to measure it. You know, we have the most polarization we've had in 100 years. So yeah, so the parties really disagree with one another and they're voting as blocks against one, one another more and more often. But that doesn't necessarily mean that we can't be civil and we can't still listen to each other and respond to each other. You teach at UNO. Um, is age come into play with it in this, this issue? Are, are younger people more civil than us crusty old men? <laughs> well, to, you know, to play to my students, I would have to say yes. You know, <laughs> okay, but assume I, I that they're not to watching. I like me and to be popular. I got that, but what's the truth, Greg? Yeah, yeah. The, truth is, the truth is there probably, I would imagine, probably isn't a lot of generational difference. I mean, 
part of the broad trend that's going on is that, and so I guess I'm about to contradict myself, but part of the broad trend that's going on is that, you know, especially since World War II, there has been this decline in social capital, which is the degree to which people are connected to one another, they're bonded in close-knit communities, they exist together in these closed social networks. And so what happens is that as social capital declines, the networks are no, these social networks are no longer closed, they become more open. And so it's harder for people to enforce their norms, you know, and so we've, we've had these norms where we wanted to have mutual respect and we wanted to listen to each other. And so one, those attitudes are sort of declining and also the ability to enforce those kinds of norms are also declining. And that is definitely a generational process. And so what Robert Putnam, for example, argues is that during World War II in the United States, there was this massive effort to really pull together to fight that war. You know, it created a massive amount of social capital. And so since then, we've kind of been regressing to the mean. Right. It's been declining and that that is a generational process. So that would suggest that the current generation uh, may be less civil than the previous generations. Finally, then I want to ask you, do you have any advice for politicians, future politicians, maybe some of your students who will get into politics? Well, I would say, you know, politicians like Senator Sass, who value the civility and who are very concerned about what's happening, you know, do, you know write books about it, talk about it, you know, emphasize how it's important. Um, having, a, having this broadcast is important because the only way that we're going to get things to start changing is for us to talk about it with each other in our communities, in our households, in our neighborhoods, and also through the media. Greg, thanks very much for joining us, uh, and, and I want to point out also that he, Greg also helps us out on election nights as an analyst. You do a great job then as well. Well, thank so you. The insight is uh, valuable, and hopefully we will see change, and I think everybody is, wants, is, is interested in civility. Yes. <laughs> Greg, thanks. All right, we're going to be right back with some uh, final thoughts. First, a reminder, your comments, they're an important part of the show. A lot of you, by the way, commented on last week's show with Mannheim Steamroller founder Chip Davis. Chris Kammerer wrote, I loved your interview this morning. Raj Brad agreed, saying, great interview, Rob and Chip. Christmas made more special with Chip Davis and Mannheim Steamroller. And Judy Hagen picked up on something. She wrote, I think you both enjoyed your visit. I know I did. Well, Judy, I will tell you, you are very astute. If you want to be heard, email your comments to news at KETV.com. Love hearing from you, and we'll be right back. Welcome back to KETV News Watch 7's Chronicle. This morning we've been talking about civility in politics and how we can agree to disagree with each other without becoming enemies. We hope this gave you something to think about as we head into the holidays and you gather together with friends and family. The McCartneys always talk politics around my dinner table. It is a healthy debate. And remember, if you missed any part of the show or you want to watch it again, we'll put it online. Just go to our homepage at KETV.com. Click on the menu button and then look for Chronicle. Well, I'm Rob McCarty. Thanks for watching and thanks for being civil. We're going to see you back here next Sunday morning for KETV News Watch 7's Chronicle. But we leave you this morning with some shots of the setting sun from our chief photographer, Scott Buer.